Hello, Jared Nimi here with a mini lecture on hierarchical models. Much of the approach here is based on the approach taken in Bayesian Data Analysis, second edition by Gelman et al. Um, previously, we've discussed a, an example. We're using the Mason Plumley free throw percentages or free throw uh, makes and attempts across years, and we show that this is, can be formulated as a multi parameter model, uh, but in fact, you end up having independent analyses across the years. As a refresher, our model here is that the data, which is the number of free throws made in a season, are binomial, with ni attempts for each season and theta i being the true free throw percentage for that season. And we assume that the data were independent across the seasons. And each season has its own uh, individual free throw percentage. And we placed a prior on these free throw percentages that was a beta alpha beta prior. In our previous analysis, I believe this was a beta 1 1 prior that we tended to use. All right, so this approach we showed is a, a multi-parameter model, but in fact it results in an independent analysis for each of the different seasons. And somehow it seems like it would make sense to sort of borrow information across the seasons. After all, this is the same player that's taking the free throws from one season to the next, and somehow we want to say that what their free throw percentage was last year should be somewhat similar to what it is this year. Right, so that's going to be the approach that these hierarchical models are going to allow us is to uh, learn something about the free throw percentage this year based on the free throw percentage last year. All right, so generically, this is the structure of a hierarchical model. All right, so in the first level, we have our data. The data are independent according to some distribution that depends on the parameter theta i. And in this case, we notice that each data point has its own parameter theta. The next level of the hierarchy says that the thetas come from some common distribution that depends on some hyperparameters, phi. So far, this is exactly the structure that we had in the previous example. But in the previous example, we said that we knew what this distribution was right here. So the additional complexity here, given in the hierarchical model, is that we're going to say, no, we actually don't know that distribution. We know the functional form, and it has some parameters, phi. And now we're going to actually place a prior on those parameters phi. Right, so this is adding one level to the hierarchy and making it a hierarchical model. All right, so I just want to make a couple of notes. The first thing to note is that yi is the only thing that's known. Right, that, are, that is your observations. Theta i, or we call this vector theta, and phi, those are the parameters. These are the unknowns in the model. And so one thing to quickly note is that there are actually more parameters in this model than there are observations. Right? There's one observation for every theta i, and in, in addition to theta i, there's the parameter phi. Right? And also note that the prior they're actually setting for the entire analysis is the prior on phi. That is, the prior on theta is going to change depending on what values phi has over the course of the analysis. All right, so let's uh, go back to our example just to show how, oh, ah, before we get to the example, let's talk about the uh, doing some posterior inference in hierarchical models. So the goal typically is the posterior distribution of both the data specific parameters, the theta i's, as well as the prior parameters phi. All right, so if we just use Bayes' rule, we get that the posterior distribution here is proportional to the likelihood being conditional on both the theta and phi times the prior for theta and phi. Well, we can remember our conditional independence rules and note that our data are independent of phi if we know the theta. And we can take this joint distribution and break it down into a conditional distribution of theta given phi times the distribution for phi. All right, I'll correct the typo here. This should be a phi, not a pi. All right, so uh, we might also be interested in marginal distributions for theta and for phi. And we can find those by taking integrals. All right, so if we want the marginal distribution for theta, then we take the integral over the joint distribution, integrating over phi. And similarly, we can do the same thing to find the marginal distribution of phi. 
integrating over theta. We're now just keep in mind that this integral is in fact a multiple integral depending on how many parameters theta there are. All right, so I just want to remind you that in doing Bayesian parameter estimation or Bayesian analysis in general, the key thing that we're always going to do is we're going to put the unknowns on the left of the conditioning bar and the knowns on the right of the conditioning bar. And that's going to be proportional to something that we're going to get via Bayes' rule, and that's going to describe the assumptions you have to make. So in particular here we've described, we've made an assumption about a conditional independence uh, through our statistical model and the hierarchical structure of our model. And so you need to really pay close attention to conditional independence when you're trying to derive these posteriors. All right, so back to our free throw example. Recall that the model here was that our data are binomial, and we have a prior on the free throw percentage for each year that's a beta distribution. And this so far looks exactly like the model we've had previously, but now we're gonna add another structure onto the model where we take alpha and beta, and we're not gonna set them like we did previously, but instead we're gonna put a prior distribution on those hyperparameters. All right, so just to make sure the notation is clear from the generic notation for a hierarchical model that we've been using, where we had a phi. In this case, phi is just the two-component vector here consisting of alpha and beta. And so in this model, alpha and beta is really going to be describing the variability in free throw percentages across seasons. And the key thing that we're going to do is we're going to try to learn about this variability. We're trying to infer what alpha and beta are, and those in turn tell us about the variability in free throw percentage across the season for Mason Plumley in college. All right, so one question then is, well, what do we put for priors in alpha and beta? And there's much discussion on this uh, starting on page 128 in Bayesian data analysis. And I just want to make a couple of comments here just to recap what they said. Um, and so one of the priors that they discussed is trying to take, well, first of all, they reparameterize the problem in terms of the log of the alpha over beta, which turns out to be the logit of the mean estimate for the free throw percentage. And this here, in this parameterization, alpha plus beta ends up being the prior sample size. The log of that is just the log of the prior sample size. And so the idea here is you're trying to get the analysis, uh, both uh, for, well, we're trying to obtain a prior using parameters that are more meaningful, right? Alpha and beta on their own aren't that meaningful, but the log of alpha or beta, which is the mean, and the log of alpha plus beta, which is the sample size, are more meaningful, and thus might allow a, uh, an informative prior. The other thing that this parameterization does is it shifts the, uh, the positive restricted parameters alpha and beta into being uh, able to be on the whole real line. Right, so both of these parameters exist on the whole real line. All right, so what you might want to do here is to use this parameterization and just say it's uniform over the whole real line. Unfortunately, this leads to an improper posterior and therefore cannot be used. Uh, there is another prior that ends up being used by Gelman and other authors. Uh, it turns out to be this functional form, which is, uh, leads to a proper posterior and ends up being equivalent on the original parameters alpha and beta to a prior of this form. Uh, but they comment that this is a reasonable prior uh, in their case, so it's a, a non-informative prior and can be used in their case because they have a lot of data, but unfortunately we don't. And by a lot of data, what we really mean here is the number of seasons that we're looking at. So in this case, we only have four seasons. That's not much information to uh, inform us about the parameters alpha and beta. They uh, also comment on a uniform prior with a with the large range. Notice here that there is a typo in the book that you should have gotten from the RADA uh, on the book's website. So this is a proper prior, and therefore will lead to a proper posterior, at least almost surely. Uh, the, the issue here is that this proper prior, although it seems vague because it's uniform, is in fact not very vague at all. And in fact, this uh, puts a lot of mess on values of alpha and beta that are extremely large. And a beta distribution with values of alpha and beta that's extremely large ends up being uh, a, a distribution with very little variance. 
So in this case, this fire that seems vague is in fact not vague at all. All right, so the last thing I want to mention is that because we have so little data, we might want to consider using a more informative prior. And we're going to go ahead and, and wait till next time uh, to look at what different priors, how d using different priors affect the posterior. To wrap up, I just want to recall the basic structure of a hierarchical model. That is, we have a model for our data, and then we have a model for the parameter, right? So, and this is defined by some parameters theta, and there's a, a prior, if you will, on the parameters theta, but that depends on some hyperparameters phi, and these hyperparameters phi have some distribution that's set for the analysis. Now, there's no reason that we need to stop right here. We can, in fact, make more levels to our hierarchy. So here's an example. We add one more level. So now the parameters phi depend on some uh, parameters psi. And psi now has the distribution that's set for the entire analysis. Right? In order to use this model, we would actually need data that has a hierarchical structure. But the point here is that, that you can continue on and use more and more levels of hierarchy, as long as it makes sense for your particular problem. And the last thing I just want to remind you is that when you are driving the posteriors that you're interested in, uh, you need to remember the conditional independent structure that exists in your model. Right? So in fact, this hierarchical, this extension of the hierarchical model to one more level where now we want the joint posterior for theta, phi, and psi, we can rewrite it uh, in this using uh, properties of conditional independence and deconstructions of joint into marginals and conditionals. So you should be able to check for yourself that this is actually true. Alright, thanks.